Hello and welcome to the Thursday, September 22nd, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier today took a look at phishing pages that are not hosted on compromised servers, but instead they take advantage of free services to host various components of the phishing kit. In particular, Xavier is looking at some resources that may not be as well known as, for example, Google Forms. One example is catbox.moe. A simple free file hosting site, as so often it does allow files up to 200 megabytes. By the way, if anybody knows why this is sort of a common limit, uh, let me know. And that's, of course, sufficient for most HTML and uh, collateral like images and such that you may need uh, to create a phishing page. Of course, where Google Forms still shines here is that you also get sort of that form submission part. Well, uh, there are other services that allow you to take care of this. Formsubmit.co is one that Xavier has observed being used for phishing sites. It also does actually do the submission for you. So it turns the form submission in an email so you don't have to write any code. I mentioned uh, before, I think about two weeks ago, IPFS.io. That's another uh, service that allows you uh, to sort of create forms and host them essentially in their IPFS uh, cloud. This requires a little bit more work, uh, but still quite effective. And of course, doesn't have that annoying uh, disclaimer that you have in all Google Forms that basically tells people that this is not a legitimate login page and uh, that you shouldn't submit any passwords. But the real lesson here is that any free service like this uh, will be abused. So if you offer a free service like this, you may have uh, good intentions, uh, but please come up with some kind of uh, abuse handling uh, procedure and some proactive tools that will limit how the service can be used for phishing. Hosting malware and such would, of course, be another issue, but that's sometimes easier limited by just limiting the file types that you allow. And an older Python vulnerability is making waves again and maybe finally getting the attention it deserves. Originally, this was disclosed in 2007 and assigned CVE 2007 Four five five nine. The problem here is the Python tar file package, in particular the tar file extract feature. Very common bug when you're dealing with sort of decompression, in particular uh, sort of unpacking of uh, deep directory structures, that there is a possibility, in particular with directory traversal tricks and such, that an attacker is able to trick you into overriding or creating files in locations that you didn't intend to create location uh, files for. Now, this vulnerability was never really fixed. The only thing that was really changed is that a note was added to the manual page, basically advising users that this may happen and to be careful if you are extracting tar files from unverified sources. But well, who reads the manual? And apparently not a lot of people are reading the manual. Now security company Trellix uh, took a closer look at this particular problem. They did sort of some GitHub sampling and then extrapolated. So a little bit hard to tell how good their numbers are, but they estimate that there are about 300,000 projects on GitHub that are susceptible to this vulnerability. And like I said, uh, this tends to affect uh, similar packages as well. If you are blindly sort of untarring, unsipping, decompressing, unpacking files that you are receiving uh, from random users, well, uh, better be careful and uh, validate as well as you can. Maybe sandbox things so no important files are being overwritten. 
And Twitter today notified many of its users that it failed to log out users' devices after the user changed their password. The reason I mention this is not because it's a Twitter, but because this is a problem that I do see quite often and something that's often not really very well addressed, in particular in some of the more uh, modern web applications. Typically after logging in, some form of token is stored in the device and well sort of by design this token is not really related to your password it shouldn't really be related to your password so as a side effect if you change your password that token may remain valid one quick fix here often is to just limit the lifetime of this token basically the session uh, lifetime but this is really an imperfect fix here if the user changes their uh, password, you must invalidate those tokens. That can be a little bit tricky in some of these more modern applications where basically these tokens are these like you know, signed OAuth tokens or such that uh, are not necessarily sort of validated in just one location. And talking about OAuth tokens, there is often that misconception that they get invalidated uh, when the password is being reset. That's usually not the case. So uh, this is often, I think, more a user interface uh, problem than anything else, where it can be hard to find uh, what applications, what devices you actually have registered with a particular account. And users should certainly be warned of this as they are changing their password because attackers if they get a hold of your password, will often start out by setting themselves up with an OAuth token in order to continue to retain access to the account even after the password is changed. Well, and this is it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.